All right, hello everyone, and in this video, this is going to be a linear rotation guide video. So of course, Lenny's Banner has already gone out of commission because we are currently in 4.1. So this video is mainly dedicated to those who already have Lenny and are either still unsure of how to exactly use him or just want a little bit more of an in-depth guide for his rotations and how to optimally play him. So my name is Anchovies and my Lenny is C1. So please take that into account when I'm demonstrating some of this gameplay. This is not going to be realistic for people who have C0. However, I will still be showing rotations around C0 regardless. So without further ado, let's just get into it. And for just some additional info, my Lenny is very heavily invested. I have him C1, Aqua Simulacra. I have Four Piece March as the Hunter, Attack Sands, Power Goblet, and Crit Circlet. This is usually the standard build and artifact four piece set that you want to go on Lenny because he benefits from both the two piece and the four piece effect. And he has a pretty general standard build for most DPS characters. So really easy to build him. If you don't have a pyro goblet yet, that's like good. You can use attack percent goblet. That's what I used when I was first playing Lenny. And it was still able to get the job done relatively fine. So until you get a good power damage goblet, then you can just rock an attack percent one. However, if you don't have four piece March as a hunter, I'll get into more of the nuance rotations involving other artifact sets and certain weapons as well. But for now, we're just going to rock with four piece March as a hunter. And I'm mainly just going to show you the general rotation and the idea behind how to play Lenny. So one of the main things to take note of in regards to Lenny is the way that his prop surplus stacks work. Because as you know, when he shoots a charge level two shot, he shoots a prop arrow and it'll consume his HP. And then after it consumes HP, he gains a prop surplus stack. Now the thing about these stacks is the way that they work is that it'll only be removed after 30 seconds out of combat. So this makes Lenny very flexible in some of his rotations where you don't always need to maximize on every single charge shot all the time. If you're even able to weave in just a couple of charge shots, you already have a decent amount of damage that you've already put on your Lenny. And this is especially relevant for teams where you're not using a shielder. So for example, if you're doing like triple pyro with Xiangling and you're using Kazuha and you literally have no defensive utility to like protect you, then this especially becomes very useful to use. Another thing to note is how his AoE is consolidated because of the way that his AoE works. So he has AoE in his burst, obviously, with his initial explosion of fireworks. And he also has AoE in his elemental skill. However, the AoE on his elemental skill works a little bit differently. So I'm just going to demonstrate it here. So the way his regular flourish works is if you go ahead and cast his skill in whatever direction you're facing, it'll do it in like this little circumference here. It'll do it like in this AoE right in front of him. However, if you have, say, like a prop surplus stack and you have a hat that's on the field. So when you summon it again, it'll do the AoE wherever you're facing. And as you notice, the cat's also exploded over here. So this makes it to where his AoE is actually a little bit larger than it may appear. However, this does also mean that you need to make sure that your Grimalkin hats are at least somewhat properly placed because there are some cases where enemies are a bit far away from each other and if you decide to shoot enemies from a large distance and then you cast your elemental skill the aoe is going to be a little bit spread apart and it's not probably going to be in the best of your interest to be doing it like that that's why i usually wait to get enemies closer together before i start doing my elemental skill with the grimalkin hats on field but regardless using the hats to increase your aoe is very very vital because then if you do it like this See how it covers this and then it even extends like all the way over here. So it leaves a little bit of room for error in AoE situations and overall makes them both good in single target and some AoE situations, especially taking into account that in a lot of Lenny teams, you're probably going to be using an Anima buffer like Kazuha or maybe Sucrose or maybe even Lynette. And especially Lynette at higher constellations has a little bit more crowd control. So having that crowd control to get enemies together in AoE situations is really beneficial. All right, so now we're going to be heading into the abyss. This is the current Genshin 4.1 abyss. So I'm going to go ahead and showcase him on the first half. All right, so this is of course the newest boss that they introduced. And so we have to obviously break its shield first before anything else. So I'm going to go ahead and get that out the way real quick. So one charge shot, two charge shot, three shot, and then burst. And then that's usually the general rotation for how to play Lenny. And that's how we're going to be doing most of the time. That's just how he works. So again, we're going to do Bennett Burst. And then Kazuha. And then one. Two. Three. 
And then I'll have burst this rotation, so I'm just going to cast this skill. But that's what I mean when I say flexible, because he still put out a decent amount of damage, even though I didn't use his element of burst. And then as you can see, we were able to clear this like before 9 minutes in the timer. So that was pretty much a perfect example of if you don't even have your burst, you can still output really, really good damage on Lenny because his talent scalings are just that high. And that's one of the amazing things about him is that, of course, his team flexibility isn't that great. But because of that, he compensates for it by being able to dish out really large amounts of upfront damage in both single target and AoE. So now we're going to go ahead and go on to the second half where I'm going to show him in a little bit more of an AoE heavy situation. Just so you get a general idea of how he does actually work in situations like AoE. And by the way, you almost always see me running this team with Lenny Bennett, Kazuo Zhongli. I personally think this is pretty much his most standard team, mainly just because of Zhongli's shield especially. The amount of comfort and consistency that Zhongli's shield gives to allow Lenny to do his entire charge attack sequence, in my opinion, is really, really valuable. Of course, I know how to play with Triple Pyro with Zhongling. I just prefer to have the shield for the sake of comfort and just because I have Zhongli and it's like, why not? Why not use him? Alright, so let's go ahead and demonstrate him in this AoE situation. Now, in more AoE heavy situations, I actually opt to start with a charge attack instead of waiting until I have all my buffs. So we're going to go ahead and demonstrate that right now. And then Bennett burst and then I start with his burst and then I just do some charge shots and then I have five stacks and then pretty much just rinse and repeat pretty straightforward in my opinion And yeah, and I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect all the time either. That's the great thing about Lenny is that his rotations do not always have to be picture perfect. You can be very flexible with when you time your stuff and it'll still work out just fine. Um, and I completely forgot about this part, so I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> but yeah, as you can see, really good in AoE, really good in single target. And especially if you have a crowd controller in AoE situations like Kazuo, for example, which is usually who you're going to be using very strong unit overall. So now let's cover some more nuanced situations where maybe you don't have Marchesi Hunter or of course you're not going to have Aqua Simulacra. So let's go ahead and show a case like maybe Polar Star. Now in this situation, the key thing about Polar Star is the way that the stacks work because they are independent of each other, meaning that you have to trigger one each time to get a stack. And one of the stacks is a normal attack and obviously Lenny is going to struggle with getting this because normal attacks are not a part of his normal attack sequence. Most of his damage is coming from charge attacks, his burst, and his skill. And with Polar Star, you're especially more incentivized to start with his elemental burst just to get that stack out the way. And then after that, you can easily get his charge attack stack. And then towards the end, obviously his elemental skill. However, by the time that you cast your elemental skill, that's actually at the end of rotations. So you actually won't really get full uptime with this stack. So on average, you're probably going to get two stacks, maybe three stacks. And this is why with this weapon, it synergizes a little bit better with sets like Shimano's Reminiscence, which is not a set I would really recommend using them on. I would only use this set if you absolutely need to. However, if you do use Shimano's Reminiscence and you're still farming for a March as Hunter set, it actually does synergize decently well with this weapon, especially because on most rotations with Shimanawas, you're actually going to be starting with his elemental skill. And so you can start with his elemental skill, do charge attacks, and you can weave in a normal attack at the very beginning after your elemental skill if you really want to. And that's actually something that I do recommend if you are using Polar Star, is to just get used to just randomly weaving in a normal attack. And you can do this either at the start or like after a certain time period. So in my case, before I had Aqua, I just did it like this where I like started with my elemental skill, we did a normal attack and then just did the rest. And then I was able to get at least three stacks and it worked out pretty decently for me. And then at the end, when you cast your elemental burst, you'll usually have full stacks and then your burst gets all those stacks together when you cast it and then explodes and deals a lot of damage. So overall that ends up being really, really good. And so that's why I usually only really ran this when I had to use Shimanawas. But with Marjasi Hunter, it 
it's a little weird, especially because March of the Hunter already gives you 36% crit rate and it's a crit rate weapon. And you're usually not going to start rotations with March of the Hunter with your elemental skill because that's just completely unnecessary and you're not going to benefit from the max stacks if you do it like that. So this just becomes a weird weapon to use overall with this set. However, nonetheless, it is still usable, but as you can see, I'm already kind of overcapping on crit rate with this. So I'm probably going to have to switch this out. And I'm using a crit damage circlet as well, and I'm still still maxing out pretty hard on crit rate. So you can definitely see how easy of a problem capping out can be when you're using crit rate stat weapons. However, I'm going to go ahead and switch to my Shimanawa set, and then I'm just going to show you a more specific rotation with Shimanawa's and Polar Star. All right, so this is what our ratio is looking like after we put on Shimanawa's Reminiscence. Still high crit rate, but it's a bit more manageable because we're not going to get any more crit rate from the March Jesse Hunter stuff. So it's relatively decent. Not the best, but like not the worst. So let's go ahead and demonstrate it in the Abyss. So we're going to go ahead and demonstrate this Polar Star rotation here in this first half. It's almost literally the exact same as with Shimano's Reminiscence, except for the fact that you're probably not always going to burst every rotation. So that's something to keep in mind, and it's kind of a big hindrance, but at the same time, it's still Lenny, so you'll still deal a good amount of damage, but missing out on that burst uptime is a little bit of a downside. However, the rotation for Polar Star and just in general Shimano's Reminiscence are very similar. Only difference really is that I'm going to be weaving in a normal attack before I do the rest of my charge attack sequence when I'm using Polar Star. With Shimano's Reminiscence, you don't need to do that. That part is only specific for Polar Star that I personally use. So anyway, let's go ahead and demonstrate it here. Okay, my rotation was a little bit messy in there, but you can see the general idea, at least especially within the first rotation, where I started with my elemental skill, and then I did a normal attack in between before I did the rest of my charge attack sequence. And then because obviously it was the first rotation, I was able to use my elemental burst, and so that also did a pretty good chunk of damage as well. So that's the general Shimano's Reminiscence rotation, and with a normal attack weaved in there that's specifically for Polar Star circumstances. Other than that, there's nothing else needed to mention in terms of nuance. The only other thing is maybe for Vermilion Hereafter. However, I didn't really need to ever run this set because I already had a decent Shimanawa set and that was good enough as is. However, if you had to start with Vermilion Hereafter or you still have to use this and you still don't have a good Marchesi Hunter set, the only thing that really changes with this set is that it does require you to put more emphasis on some energy to be able to burst every rotation because the four piece passive effect only works after using an element to burst, which is where you gain that attack percent. And that's very, very important. So if you're not bursting every rotation, then this set just heavily falls in priority, to be honest. And that's why I generally didn't use it. And again, because I already had a good 4P Shimanawa set. So it didn't really matter for me personally. All right, so now I've got him back on his regular build. So now let's get into specific team setups. So in almost every single team, you will always need Bennett. Bennett is a necessity in every single Lenny team. Now, the reason he is a necessity is just the fact that he gives healing, he gives a flat attack buff, and it's really, really good for Lenny. It gives him a lot of damage just from Bennett alone. And of course, Bennett is a pyro character, so he's going to help Lenny get some extra damage through his Ascension 4 passive. And overall, Bennett is just a staple in every single Lenny team. Now, the last two slots are going to heavily depend on the situation that you're in and what you want to use. In the vast majority of scenarios, I almost always run Kazuha and Zhongli. This is the team that I almost always run Lenny in. Kazuha, because of his elemental damage buff that he gives through his Ascension 4 passive, really, really good, especially in mono element teams. And then Zhongli for the fact of his really strong shield. 
which allows me to play Linny more consistently and not get interrupted as easily. Now, of course, I'm able to play Linny without Zhongli. However, I just tend to use Zhongli just for the sake of not really having to think and be able to turn my brain off most of the time. Now, on occasion when I can get away with not running Zhongli, then this is when I'll do a team like this, where it is triple power with Xiangling and Kazuha. In terms of damage output, this is generally his best team. And this is especially if you have Xiangling at higher constellations and more specifically C6, because she gives that 15% power damage bonus during her power nado. And of course her C4 extends her power nato duration, and so she contributes a decent amount to the team's overall damage output as well as Lenny, and this archetype overall is very strong. Now in cases where you still want to use triple power, but maybe you don't want to use Zhongling and you really want a defensive option, but then let's say you don't have a character like Zhongli. Well, there are actually a decent amount of options that you can choose from. The first main option I would generally say is Yanfei. Now Yanfei, especially at C4, grants a shield when she casts her element of burst. Now the main downside to this is that Yanfei needs a lot of energy to be able to cast her burst every rotation because her burst costs 80 energy. However, there are many ways you can circumvent this by either giving her an ER Sands or Prototype Amber. And maybe in a case where you have enough energy recharge in your substats, you can potentially get away with running Thrilling Tails on her, which I personally am able to. And that can actually be swapped to Linny to give him a 48% attack buff, which is really good for him. And also because she is still a Pyro character, she's still going to contribute to Linny's Ascension 4 and allow him to gain the maximum damage bonus from his Ascension 4 passive. The next person to consider is Jinyan for Triple Pyro. And Jinyan at C2 are higher because of the way that her C2 works, where when you cast her Elemental Burst, it grants the level 3 shield immediately, so she's not as reliant on AoE when she is at that constellation, which makes her a really good burst shielder for Lenny. And then when you put her on Tenacity of the Millilith, because of the way that her shield works, technically counts as an Elemental skill, I think. So it'll still technically proc Tenacity, and it'll give him that nice 20% buff that Zhang Li would give anyways through his shield. And on top of that, she is a pyro character, which again, busts his Ascension 4 passive. So this is another viable option for him. Now, another one is Dehya. However, Dehya is a little bit lower in priority, and I haven't gone to personally test her, but just from what I've been able to see, both in terms of sheet calculations, as well as people who have demonstrated actual gameplay, is that the uptime on her resistance to interruption is a little bit limited, especially its full uptime taken into consideration her Ascension 1 passive, I think, which heavily increases it. So her uptime is a little bit on the down end, and of course in the fact that her elemental skill has a 20 second cooldown, which is not cute, it's really not giving. So she's not necessarily as priority compared to even like a C2 Jinyan or a C4 Yanfei, but she is still usable for that triple pyro slot. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention Toma. The problem with Toma is that he has a good shield, but the problem is his burst, and especially his C6 buff, only works when characters trigger normal attacks. So it gets a little awkward and Toma's buffing capabilities aren't as prevalent in this team, which automatically puts him in lower priority. And on top of that, the way that his shield refreshes also relies on normal attacks, so he pretty much just ends up becoming an E skill bot shield character at that point, which isn't really that amazing, and honestly not really the reason why you pick Toma. You usually want to pick Toma on a character that can trigger normal attacks consistently to benefit the most from his shield. So this overall just makes him not as priority of a pick compared to the other options. So now let's get onto non-pyro options, and especially in cases where you need that last slot and maybe you want to use a defensive utility character. There are a few options. You could use Diana. Diana can work. Not the best, but not the worst. I mean, her shield is just decent enough to where you can at least get a couple charge shots off on Lenny, and it'll work decently fine. Another one is Layla. Layla's shield is especially pretty strong, especially when you have her well built. So she can actually be a decent option, but the thing to note with her and especially with her and Kirara, which is the other person that I was going to mention as another option for the shield position because both of their shields are actually pretty good. However, you don't want to cast their elemental burst because it can mess with the pyro aura, which ends up making Lenny lose his ascension 4 damage buff. So that's one thing to keep in mind when using their abilities is to honestly just never really use their burst. Their purpose in this team is to be a shield bot. And I think that generally covers it. I have tried melt variations with like Shunha, for example, where the main thing isn't even really her cryo application, but more so her normal and charge attack buff on her hold skill. But it's it, it's just whatever. Don't don't mess with it too much. It's not to say that they don't work. I was able to surprisingly make a melt team work with Linny, with like Linny, Bennett, Kazuha, and then like Rosaria or Shunha or uh, Kaya even. Although Kaya is not the better option, I would personally use Rosaria in that sense. 
if you do decide to run a melt team, but I'm not the biggest fan of melt with Lenny in my opinion, but it's, it's usable. You can use it. It's just not that great. Another potential flex slot is actually Baiju because of the fact that he provides a little bit of resistance to interruption in his elemental burst. It, it's just, it's there, but I wouldn't highly recommend it. It's sort of just like an option that you can use if you absolutely need to type of thing. So now onto the Anima buffers, which is this last slot here. Honestly, an Anima buffer is almost always needed. In Lenny teams, if I'm going to be so honest, he benefits a lot from the VV Shred, and especially characters like Kazuha that can give extra damage percent buffs. Really, really good for him. So Kazuha is a top choice. The next choice, of course, is Circros if you're able to take advantage of it. Although her C6, as we all know, her elemental burst is very inconsistent with its absorption. So unless you know 100% you're going to get that pyro absorption, don't even bother. Just try to get a pyro swirl really quickly and then just swap in. The main thing with her is her VV Shred. And this is a similar case with characters like Lynette and Farazan if you don't have any other animal characters. Hell, even Jean and Zayu. And so that's the general team guide. I guess the only other thing I do want to mention is how much his C1 affects his gameplay. And this is because I already have him at C1. So I think I can speak on this personally a little bit more. So the main difference that he knows between his C0 and his C1 gameplay is that his it made his rotations a lot more flexible than they already are. There were more situations where I was able to start with a charge attack. And because it already summons two hats and gives two prop surplus stacks, for only the cost of one charge shot, I was able to start most rotations with a charge shot and then swap out and then swap back in and then do two more charge shots and then burst a bit more easily. I guess the main difference that I'm trying to say here is that it's really easy to get five stacks on C1 versus C0. Although C0, you can get five stacks, but by the time that you cast your burst in most rotations, that Bennett buff is either just about to expire or in most cases is probably already expired by then. And you're not gonna gain the full benefit of using your burst with that Bennett buff by then. However, at C1, this alleviates this a little bit more. It makes using this burst while Bennett's buff being still active a bit more easier. And this is a similar case even with his elemental skill as well. All right, so that's going to end this rotation guide. I hope that you found this useful. And if there's anything that you wish I added or anything else, leave that down in the comments below. Or if you have any additional questions, then same thing there. And if you enjoyed, then be sure to subscribe for more Kitchen Impact content. And until the next video, bye bye